that's why we were defeated. So we are, uh, we are occupied mentally and physically by the United States. <laughs> it's like someone who adopted a child. He controls him, that's it. He gives him food, he gives him money, he gives him candy. But in reality, he can lock him in a room whenever he wants. You are a servant of someone. Instead of being servants of Hashem, we are the servants of the nations, of the United States and others. So they claim 500 of them died. I just hope that all of them were terrorists. I don't want to see children and women dying there. I hope that it's all the terrorists who hide in the hospital. You know, every bullet has an address. Whether a Jew die, whether an Arab die, in the end Hashem decides who lives and who dies in Rosh Hashanah. So every Jew who died so far, unfortunately, was written on Rosh Hashanah. And every Arab that died, it was written also on Rosh Hashanah. It's the same executor, HaKadosh Baruch Hu. No difference. When he executed Jew, he executed Jew. When he executed Gentile, he executed Gentile. It's in his hand who would live and who will die. And who will get hurt, who will recover, and who will not. Who would lose his business, who would lose his home, who will have to move away to exile and run for his life. Everything is written on Rosh Hashanah. Abotai, it's written in a Torah. It's written in a Torah, Ki Hashem Elokecha, מתהלך בקרב מחנך. השם יוגד is walking inside your camp, inside your territory, להצילך, to save you. He's your guard, he's your keeper. ולתת אויביך לפניך, and to surrender your enemies in front of you. והיה מחנך הקדוש, should know that the condition for that is that your territory has to be holy. Your place, Israel, or other Jewish communities, keep it holy. How do you keep it holy? ולא יראה בך ערוות דבר ושב מאחריך. Make sure there is no lack of modesty. There's nothing I hate more than violations when it comes to men and women. Men and women mix, all kinds of horrible parties, naked people jumping like monkeys all night for three days, drugged up, inter-relationship inter with Jews and non-Jews, men and women that are not married, committing the worst, Isurei Karet, and all the other things, Hashem Yerachem, this I will not tolerate. This kind of behavior will have massive, devastating consequences. What is the, what's the consequences? I would leave you alone. I would leave you. I won't guard you. I would leave your camp. I'm not with you. I'm not watching over you. I leave you in the hand of your enemies. It's a verse in the Torah. I want to remind you, I did not write the Torah in case you are confused. I'm only reading to you what's written here. Ki Hashem Elokecha mitalech bekerev machanecha. Hashem is walking around you in the streets of Israel. Leatzilcha, to save you. Latet oivecha lefanecha, to surrender your enemies under you. Vaya machanecha kadosh. Make sure your territories are holy. Ve'lo yirai b'cha ervat davar. Everything that has to be covered, make sure nobody can see it. Meaning modesty. Ervat davar. If I will see ervat davar, if I see naked women on the street, ve'shav me'acharecha. I'm sorry, but I cannot be in such a place. Once I go out, who comes instead? The Hamas mass murderer field. They take my place. You have to decide who do you want to be, in, hand, in my hands or the hands of these monsters. And what did we decide? Obviously, we didn't know what we are doing, but now we understand. 
That's why a lot of Israelis now are waking up. I was on the radio for more than an hour on Sunday in Channel 2000. Once the show goes on, we ask people to accept on themselves mitzvot that they don't keep. In one hour, we had more than 50 new Shomrei Shabbat. In one hour show, more than 50 people, and I'm kabel or mekabelet al atzmi to keep Shabbat. Some accept Birkat Amazon, some accept to pray, some accept to put filin. Everyone accepts something on himself. But for me, the most critical thing is Shabbat. Why? Because once you become Shomer Shabbat, everything follows automatically. If you become, uh, if you put filin, there's no guarantee you'll, do, you'll be a Baal Tshuva. If you start saying Birkat Amazon, there's no guarantee you'll be Baal Tshuva. If you pray once a day, there's no guarantee you'll be a Baal Tshuva. No matter what you do, we cannot call you a Baal Tshuva. We cannot call you a religious Jew. You give tzedakah to the shul. You secular, who gives tzedakah. You make brachot here and there. You secular, that make brachot. You put filin. Secular, that put filin. Everything you do, you still defined as a secular Jew. Except one thing. Once you become Shomer Shabbat, nobody will call you secular anymore. People already know you become Baal Tshuva. That's not perfect. You still have a long way to go. But you cannot deny that you're becoming religious once you become Shomer Shabbat. Why? Because Shabbat is the foundation of everything. Once you keep it, it would lead to everything else. And it's also uh, very logical and very normal. Why? Because you begin to start coming to the synagogue. You see a lot of religious people. You meet people. They invite you. You sit in their table. You see the family. You see the religious kids. You hear the divrei Torah. Then they give you a book, read this, watch this. You know, you begin, you're starting to change your lifestyle. Plus, in a synagogue, the rabbi is giving two, three speeches on Shabbat, and then they say, well, there's a shiur before Mincha, why don't you come? It's always like that. Mitzvah, goreret mitzvah. Once you open the door, Hashem opens other doors for you. That's why Shabbat is the first thing we have to push. Also, one more thing that is very important to push, to get a commitment from them that they would listen to at least one hour of Torah per day. Better, of course, to listen to speakers that wake up the people to do tshuva. Not these American speakers who say, you have to be besimcha, you have to be besimcha. That's all they talk about, besimcha. How can we be in simcha? Thousands of people are being slaughtered because of the way we are. Hashem is so disgusted by us that he had to bring on his own children such a horrible tragedy. Be besimcha. What does it mean, be besimcha? Soon I'm going to prove to you that it's all nonsense what they say. I'll prove it to you. Don't, you don't have to take my opinion. I'll read it to you from the Rambam. What do we have to really do right now? Be besimcha. You have to be besimcha that you're a Jew. It's a wonderful gift. You have to be besimcha that you are able to keep mitzvot. 100%. You have to be besimcha that you're able to learn Torah. Or to give tzedakah. Or to save souls. Every time you do it, you have to do it with great happiness and satisfaction that you have the merit. However... When you see tragedies and when you see that Hashem is smacking us big time, now it's not the time to dance. Don't be stupid, please. You know, I tell you one thing. I know one person that I was able to make him a Baal Tshuva and he left the religion after this tragedy. So that's it. I cannot have it anymore. Why did he leave the religion? I'll give you one guess. Huh? You would think he saw what Hashem did to his children, so he doesn't want any more to be religious, right? That's what you would think. Lack of emunah, like she said. It's not the reason. He already learned enough by my lectures that sometimes Hashem hug and kiss us, and sometimes he give us a horrible smack. He already learned that everything in life is reward and punishment. He's not questioning that. 
He also knows that everything Hashem does in the end is for a good reason. Even when we deserve to be punished. But why did he leave the religion? Because he saw American Jews dancing as usual on Simchat Torah. When they already knew that a thousand people were slaughtered in Israel. They just couldn't see it. I tried to convince him and say, listen, mitzvah to dance with the Torah. Without the Torah, we wouldn't be anything. Yes, of course, I love the Torah. I want to dance with the Torah. But how can I dance with the Torah when my brothers and sisters just got slaughtered? How can I do it? Mitzvah, not mitzvah. How can I do it? How can I do such thing? Sometimes people use it as an excuse, you know. Some people have desires. They just want to go run back to their old bad ways. They find something that is a strong excuse, and then they run away. It didn't help these few dozens of Jews who left the religion and went to that party. They got a free ticket from this lousy, wicked organization, Hillel. They got them free tickets. They sent them over there to the party as a reward that you became secular. Reward. And all of them got butchered there. Or they're now sitting in Gaza being abused. No one can win if he turns away against Hashem. You know the Americans say, if you can beat him, join him. It's very much applied to our situation. What do you want? You have two options. You want to declare a war against Hashem like Santa Claus did with his book? Or you want to put your head down and say, Hashem, what do you say? Lecha Hashem atzedaka velanu boshet apanim. Like Chazal say. יפה דנתנו, יפה גזרת עלינו, לך השם הצדקה ולנו בושת הפנים. נחפשה דרכינו ונשובה, ונחקורה ונשובה אליך. The guilt is 100% in us. Don't you ever dare, I'm giving you a good recommendation for your own good, don't you ever dare even to hint that what Hashem did to us ever, not just now, ever in history, was not fair because you, the, you rebel against the principles of the Torah. The principles that Hashem set for Judaism is he reward the righteous and punish the wicked. Sometimes he punish the, the righteous as well. If the righteous did something wrong, Hashem punished the righteous. But overall, in the end, everyone will get what they deserve. Whether he dies younger or later, in the end, everything will be calculated. There's no such thing, oh, he didn't deserve to die. There's no such thing. It's kfira to say it. If you say about someone, wow, oh, he was such a nice person, I can't understand why Hashem did this to him. He didn't deserve to die like this. This is heresy. If you see children are being murdered in a worst possible imaginable way, like we just saw, first reaction is, they don't deserve it. Where is the justice? Where is God? That's heresy. That's heresy. That's worse than eating pork, speaking like this. The same people that ask this question, they wouldn't dare to eat pork. Here, pork, eat it. I'll give you a thousand dollars, eat it. Come on. I'm a full person. Eat it! No! Eat it or I break your bones. I won't eat. Break my bone. I won't eat pork. Saying such thing, oh, it's not fair, there's no justice. Why children have to get such thing? It's heresy. It's worse than eating pork, heresy. Heresy is a very big crime. Listening to a heretic speaker, it's a very big crime. Organizing a lecture for him is a million times worse. Because now you're Mahti Arabim. So what is it? I don't understand why children die. Why? Because I don't know who they used to be in their past life. I don't know. Only God knows. Any child who died immediately go to heaven. So it's good for him. It's terrible how he died and suffered for a minute or half a minute, whatever they did to the child when they shot his head. But the suffering of the child was maximum a minute. You agree, right? How long does it take to die? Someone shoot you, or stab you, or choke you. One minute suffering. 
After that minute, that soul goes to heaven next to the Rambam and Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai for eternity. So it was a good thing for that baby or no? If the baby would stay alive and ended up in Tel Aviv, in the parties, or dancing around the Buddha statue, it would be better for him? Then he would lose his share to the world to come. So what Hashem did to him was mercy or judgment? Mercy. Because anyone who died before Bar Mitzvah, believe it or not, I know it's very hard to digest what I'm saying, but that's the divine truth. Everyone who died before Bar Mitzvah or Bat Mitzvah for a girl goes express to heaven. So that was a gift or that was a negative thing? It was a gift. But after all, he could have died going to bed without suffering. Why did he have to die in such a horrible way by this monster? Because Hashem wanted one little thing to finish with him from past life. Since he's sending him now to heaven. A second after the soul goes out of the body and goes to the court of heaven and they welcome this child and show him his place in the eternal world in the highest level of pleasure. Do you really think that he will ever regret the minute that he got a bullet in his head? Who, who should regret those who were older? 30, 40? 50, thousands of Shabbatot I didn't keep. You know, I want to tell you, last week, I get a video. And the video said, name of some Israeli guy, let's call him Itzik. Itzik was to go, was supposed to go under the chupa next week. And he just died yesterday in the war. So instead of playing the chupa song, it was played in his funeral. It's a horrible thing, no, to get such a video. Immediately you begin to cry. And then you read what's on the stage. Itzik was supposed to get married to Ben Zugo, to Avi. This is what they're bragging about. Itzik was supposed to marry in a public event to a man next week. They had a chupa song. They make chupa, they get some reform dirt to come to perform the ceremony against Hashem, which is abomination. I don't care. He was supposed to get married next week to a man. And now they make it so dramatic. Wow, they play this chupa song on his wedding. The point I'm making here is these liberal corrupted reporters already a long, long time ago became so sodomized, so terrible in their ideology, so wicked that it doesn't even have 1% difference between a man marry a woman to a man marry a man. They already adjusted it 100%. They don't see a difference. That's how corrupted they are. These Arab monsters see the difference. Those murderers who chop people's head. You're wondering to yourself, how can it be? A Jew became such a such an abomination and those monsters will not dare to do such thing? It breaks the heart. And if you go and tell them, you know, this kind of behavior, that's what got us to where we are in first place. They'll get ten times angrier. And they will hate their religion even more. Because King Solomon already spoke about this phenomena. It says, The stupidity of a person will turn him away from the right path to Hashem. And he is going to blame who? He is going to blame Hashem. I want to read to you, Rabotai, the words of the Rambam. I don't want you to go and say that I say. Many times people say, Rabbi Mizrahi say, Rabbi Mizrahi say. Rabbi Mizrahi say nothing. Rabbi Mizrahi read what's written in the books. Gemara, Rambam, Shulchan Aruch, 
חומש, זוהר, that's all. It's written in תהילים, chapter קמ"ד, 144, verse 14. Do you know what it's written? אין פרץ ואין יוצאת ואין צווחה ברחובותינו. Do you know what's the meaning of this verse? I repeat, אין פרץ ואין יוצאת ואין צווחה במחוזותינו. ברחובותינו, in our streets. Translation. There is no pretzels, meaning there are no women in the street that are not modest. None of them go out to the street with not modest clothes. If they're not modest, they're inside the bedroom. Permitted. There is no Jewish girls go out to the street with not modest clothes. This was written 3,000 years ago in Tehillim. 3,000 years ago, when the most not modest woman then was more modest than any rabbit sent today. In case you don't get the point. But even in modesty, sometimes there are minor issues and they're critical. Because Hashem does not compromise on modesty at all. Elohim sonne zima, v'aya machanecha kadosh, v'raa b'cha ervad davar v'shav ma'acharecha. I'm going to leave you immediately. Mix wedding, Hashem is not there. It's not there. You cannot enter the hall. Everyone naked under the chuppah. Hashem irachem. People don't get it. Oh, you fanatic. Oh, you're an extremist. No, no, no. I'm just sticking to the text, which I didn't write. You want to modify the, the divine book? I don't. I don't dare to do it. I rather say, the desire made me sin, that's the truth, and I am the criminal. I rather say that than to say no. What I did is the truth, meaning the Torah is incorrect. I know better. Marry men with men. That's the right way. They even give them Birkat Kohanim. Yevarechecha Hashem veishmerecha. This idiot. I'm a Kohen. As a Kohen, you go. Your mother is not Jewish. His father is Kohen. Mary Christina. So the guy comes to give Birkat Kohanim to the two gays. <sighs> so what does it mean, en peretz ve en yotzet? No woman dare to come out to the public territory, not modest. And that's why, en tzvacha birchovotenu. No one scream, no one mourn, no tragedies in our streets. Meaning, if women go out like that to the streets of Israel, what comes? Screaming and crying and funerals. This is a source. I'll give you a thousand sources. I have more than a thousand sources. No exaggeration. More than a thousand. Between the Gemara and Tehillim and the Zohar and the Chumash, more than a thousand. I just gave you two or three now. You get the point. What David HaMelech wrote in Tehillim, it's all Beruach HaKodesh. Hashem speaks from his mouth, this entire Tehillim. You read it, you get the point. No women go out into the public territory, not modest. That's why no one scream and no one cry. There's no tragedies, no reason to scream. Meaning when they go out like this to the street in Machtiot Arabim, one tragedy after the other comes. You get the point, right? It's written. I didn't write it. I want to remind you. No women go out to the street not modest. It's not what you imagine today. The way the girls dress today. Come on. That's very provocative. 3,000 years ago, what would be considered not modest to a woman? What would we consider not modest? The clothes? Pfft, you're out of your mind? Every woman would wear like a tent. Look at pictures from 100 years ago. Do you know that in 1900 in the United States, a not modest woman would get a fine on the street? Police would give her a fine. It would be against the law. 
Did you know that until the 1960s to be gay was a, cr a crime? It was a felony in the United States. You can go to jail for that. The Goim understood the Torah until then. Now they all got corrupted in, in those democratic European American countries. And Israel followed them. All of a sudden the truth changed. Wow. What was good 50 years ago, all of a sudden now it's the opposite. People became wicked, that's all. It's not, by the way, the first time. It happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, and Hashem wiped them out. It happened in the Babylonian Tower, and Hashem wiped them out and gave them serious punishment. It wasn't the first time. It happened in a flood. Everyone died. Only one family survived. Now one person left in the world. Yeah, the world didn't have 8 billion people, not even 1 billion. Well, I would assume that tens of millions of people died in the flood 4,200 years ago. Tens of millions of people. So, today no one has any idea what I'm talking about. If someone now, secular person, listen to what I say now, what, do you, what would he think? That we are not normal, we're crazy. My... Maybe he believes in God, but he never ever heard about the Torah and what the Torah say or not say. He has no idea. Whatever they brainwash him in a public school, in a university, liberal university, that's his ideology. Once all of a sudden he meets someone that comes and tells him the truth of the Torah and prove to him the Torah is divine, he gets the shock of his life. Some people react to shock by running away. Cannot handle the truth. Run away. Ignore it. Pretend they didn't see it. And some people put their nose down and their ego and say, that's it. You can beat him, join him. You can declare a war against Hashem. What will I gain? In the end, I have to pay the price. Rabotai, it's no joke here. It's mamash no joke. Let's read to you, Rabotai, an unbelievable thing that happened to King David 3,000 years ago, one of the most righteous people in the history of the world. What I'm reading to you comes from the book of Samuel A, chapter 30. Please go and read it with English translation. Vayi bevod David v'anashav tziklag. David and his people came to a city called Tziklag, Bayom HaShelishi, in the third day. V'amaleki pashtu el ha-negev el Tziklag. The Amalek, imachshimam, those Nazis, the Nazis came out of Amalek. Who is Amalek? Amalek, the king of Amalek was Agag. Agag and Aman, who wanted to kill all Jews in Persia, a man, a Agagi, from the family of Agag, who came from Amalek. And the Nazis also came from Amalek. Edom, Esav. So Amalek always tortured us, always attacking us, always. Similar to what the Palestinian Hamas do, or Hezbollah, all this kind of... Same thing with Amalek. Attacked us in the, when we came out of Mitzrayim. Now they're attacking in the Negev. Where is the Negev? Exactly where the tragedy happened. The south. Nativot, those areas. Sderot. So we've been already in that scenario. Amalek comes to the city of Tziklag. Vayaku et Tziklag vayisrefu ota. They burn the city of the Jews. Baesh. Vayishbu ota nashim. They capture all the women, similar to what happened word by word to what just happened to us ten days ago. Vaishbut anashim, they capture the women. Asherba mikaton ve'ad gadol, from babies to the oldest people. They took them prisoners. Lo imitu ish, they didn't kill the prisoners. They took them. Vayinagu vayelchu ledarkam. They went to their direction. Vayavod David vayanashav elayir. King David arrived with his people to the city. 
והנה שרופה באש, nothing is left, it's all burned. ונשיהם ובניהם ובנותיהם נשבו, they took their children, their, the boys, the girls, the wives, are all by Amalek. Who knows what they are doing to them, this wicked, evil Amalek. וישא דוד והעם אשר איתו את קולם ויבכו. They all started to cry. David cry, all his people, they all were crying. Until עד אשר אין בהם כוח לבכות. They just couldn't cry anymore. They were fainting, that's it. You know, you cry, you cry a day, two days, how much you can cry? In the end, you have no energy to cry. You're about to faint any second. You're dry, you didn't eat, you didn't drink. You're fainting, that's it. You have no more energy to cry. This was the situation, Rabotai. Two of the wives of David are now in the hand of Amalek. Achinoam Israelit ve'Avigail. Avigail, in English Abigail, and Achinoam, two of his wives. It broke the heart of David. Why? Because the nation wanted to stone him to death. The Jews, they hold him responsible to what happened. Everybody begin to demonstrate against him. Look at the situation he was in, poor David. His two wives and the children are taken. The whole city is burned. And the people now want to kill him. Doesn't even have the mind to start thinking about his family that are in the hand of these monsters. He has to deal now with people who want to kill him. Why? It's all your fault. They were so devastated for their children, the boys and the girls, not knowing if they are alive or not. Where are they? Where are we ever going to find them? It wasn't like today, Red Cross, Google, you can search, news, you can see videos, satellite. You didn't have all of that. That's it. Who knows where they are? They're alive, they're dead. There's no way to know. Everyone wants to take their frustrations on David. What did David do? Before I tell you what he did, I want to ask you, what would you do in a situation like this? A religious person, his daughters, his sons, his two wives are taken by the cruelest enemy, Amalek, of those days. They're nothing compared to the Palestinians. They already went even worse than the Nazis. Aval at that time, it was the worst option to fall in the end of Amalek. And now your own people wants to kill you. They blame you, well, our children, our daughters, our wives. Out of pain, they try to escape goat. They try to find someone to blame. What would you answer to them if you are David? What would you do? Some people would say, you're right, kill me. I don't, I don't have to deal with this misery. How can I live knowing my wives and my children are in the hand of these monsters? This poor American, his eight years old daughter was taken by the Hamas. They couldn't find her body. They're looking all over, nobody. So they assume that she's in Gaza. And you know what they do to girls over there. I don't have to tell you these pedophiles what they do. He was going crazy until the next day they called him and they said to him, we found the body of your body. She, she's not in Gaza. She died. And what did, he, what did he scream? Yes! Thank you, God, that my daughter died and she's not in the hand of those monsters. I would have done the same thing. If you know who you're dealing with, you deal with civilized people in a war, and they're taking prisoners, they give them food, they don't touch them, until one day they exchange prisoners, right? They let the Red Cross come and check them out. They give them some rights. There are laws about how to deal with prisoners. But when they fall in the hand of such monsters, you can only imagine the worst thing that can happen. The worst. For sure it will happen. 
There's no maybe yes, maybe not. When he found out that his daughter died, he started to thank Hashem and scream, yes, yes, thank you, God, thank you. This is, this is enough to explain who we're dealing with. He knew. It's not stupid. That's what happened in the Holocaust. Many righteous women would rather their children die than to put them in who knows where. They rather they let them die and go to heaven. That's it. With all the pain. So what did David do? He didn't say to them, kill me. What did he do? Vaitchazek David Beashem Elokav. What did he do? Became stronger in his faith in Hashem. Be'emunah. It's all from Hashem. Thank you, Hashem. It's all from you. I accept everything. Vaitchazek David. He became strong. Everyone wants to kill him now. His own wives are in prison. His children are who knows where. Who knows what they do to them. What is it? Some people would say, let me kill myself and get rid of this misery. Come, take me, do whatever you want to me. What did David do? Vaitchazek David v'Hashem, Rabotai. Even a sword is on your neck and you don't see even 1% of light of hope. You must be strong with emunah to Hashem. So, let me explain the whole thing again, just that you, to make sure you understand what's happening here. The Amalekim came, they killed, they butchered people, and they took a lot of prisoners. The two wives of David, his boys, his girls, they are all by the end of these monsters. Chazal are explaining to us the situation. Why Hashem gave such punishment to the people of Tziklag? The answer, machloket. They had disagreements, fights, lack of unity, baseless hatred. Exactly like we had in Israel the entire year. If you remember all the demonstration, all the, all the Lashon Hara. This kind of behavior by the people brings the most cruel enemies immediately and give them power to hurt us. This is the Gemara, Rabotai. After this tragedy, David cried until he could not cry anymore. No voice coming. And the nation of Israel wants to kill David. Rashi says, why they wanted to kill him? They want to blame him? What's the, or they just don't know anymore what they do because their heart is broken, their children are in capture. Rashi says that they blame David for being reckless. Why, did you, you, why didn't you leave guards in a city, an army? You know these Amalek are looking to kill us. You should have... You should have left security. Right? It's all because of you. And what David do? Pray to Hashem, cry to Hashem, walk on his confidence, his emunah. Kibel al atzmo et adin, Chazal say. He said to Hashem, thank you for your fair just, just judgment. I made a mistake. It's all on me. I take responsibility. I pray and I beg to Hashem for mercy. That's what he did. Vaishal David Beashem Lemor. David asked Hashem, Erdof Achare Akdudaze, should I follow and chase the Amalekim? Should I chase them? Asigenu, will I be able to find them? Vayomer lo Hashem, Hashem say to him, Redof, chase them. Ki asek tasig. You will catch them. Ve'atzel tatzil. And you will save everyone. All the people, all the prisoners. Why? What happened over here? The answer the Gemara says, 
after they all did tshuva and cried like this and accepted the judgment, it's all on us, Hashem. You are fair. You are a fair judge. You gave us what we deserved. We ask for forgiveness. Everything turned around. Army, no army, United States, boats are coming with airplanes. All of that is nonsense. If every Jew in Israel would do tshuva, do you know what would happen tomorrow morning? You wouldn't hear the word Gaza ever again. But we do it the hard way. Even though Baruch Hashem, tons of Jews in Israel now, I don't know if they did full tshuva, but definitely partial tshuva, almost everyone did. Soldiers, every soldier almost now in the Israeli army has tzitzit on him. Did you know that? Did you know that? More than 100,000 tzitziot they gave to soldiers. The religious one already had tzitziot, the non-religious. The general of the army, one of the top three, he said, in a battle, all the soldiers are always religious. One person sent me the article, said, Rabbi, it's similar to what you say in your lecture. In the hospital, everyone is religious. In the army, battling such monsters, not knowing if you go back ever to see your family or not, it could be the last day of your life. Everyone become religious. The question is, why only there? Why in a hospital, in a cancer department? Why in a battle with the monsters, all of a sudden everyone has time for Hashem? Why when they're in Tel Aviv and in other cities with beautiful life and everything works for them, why over there they forget Hashem? Now when they need him, all of a sudden everyone is religious. I promise you right now, without knowing anyone personally, but I put money on it, that many soldiers who non-stop spoke against rabbis and against Haredim the last year are walking now with tzitzit. I have no doubt about it. If 100,000 soldiers put tzitzit, a lot of them are lefties. It's half enough. Israel is half enough. So at least few thousands of them were anti-religious people. How they agree to put tzitzit? If a soldier will come and say, don't give me this nonsense. I'm anti-religion when I'm in Tel Aviv in my bed, and I'm anti-religion when I'm here in Gaza fighting. Don't sell me this nonsense. It, it doesn't work on me. Oh, at least he has... It's clear ideology. Mistaken, but at least it's not bouncing from one side to the other. The fact that he agreed to put tzitzit showed that all alone he was not really anti-religion. One chacham in Israel said this week, when you see other Jews are hating so much the religion and religious people, what's the source of this hatred? Where does it come from? The answer is jealousy. It cannot be that you live by the truth and I live in the mud, in the darkness. I am a, a drug addict to my desires. I can't control myself. I have no direction in life. All I want is drugs and clubs and beach and vacation and nothing else in my life. And look at you, you, your family, your children, with this, modesty, holidays. It kills me. But I'm a drug addict. I can't leave my drugs. So instead of blaming myself, I blame the successful one. Let's put him down. That he'll be miserable like me. If you don't believe me, you know I have proofs. So I'll read it to you. Don't say I made, it up. I made it up. Who knows which Gemara talks about this subject? Quick, who knows? Gemara in Masechet. Where is the doctor today? He didn't come. Masechet Psachim. Well, they, they together, huh? When he comes, he comes. When he does, psh, very nice. He takes him. Oh, he's the driver. Okay, makes sense. 
גמרא אין מסכת פסחים, פייג' 49, מ"ט. עם הארץ, what's עם הארץ? A total ignorant. A Jew that doesn't know Torah and doesn't have the proper manners. מידות, personality traits. Let's read the words of the גמרא. תנו רבנן, לעולם ימכור אדם כל מה שיש לו ויישא בת תלמיד חכם. A person should sacrifice everything he owns. Everything. House, today cars, belongings, money, cash, jewelry. If the only way for you to get a daughter of a high scholar of Torah, a daughter of a rabbi, to become your wife, you have to give everything you can in order for you to get that extra ultra religious girl who grew up in the house of a Talmud Chacham, to be your wife. Everything you have, כל מה שיש לו, ויישא בת תלמיד חכם. Why? שהיא מת, או גולה, מובטח לו שבניו יהיו תלמידי חכמים. If you're going to die, or go to exile, or you get captured in a war, or whatever the case may be, you know your children will be in a good hand. Of whom? Of her father, your father-in-law. He's going to adopt these kids and teach them Torah. And nothing is more important than that. Now they don't have a father. If the father-in-law is a total amaaretz, total ignorant, doesn't even know how to say brachot, no wonder the kids will go off the path completely. But if it's a high scholar of Torah, immediately take custody of those boys and will turn them into Talmidei Chachamim. So now when you are already in the next world, you can see your children from the next world, how wonderful they turn to be and how much they benefit your soul. Because if you leave righteous kids in the world, every mitzvah and every Torah they do or learn benefit your soul forever, after life. The Gemara continues, Do not agree to marry a daughter of an ignorant Jew, that if you die or go to exile, your children will also be amei aratzot. Your children will also be total ignorant. The Gemara continues, Tanu Rabbanan, Le'olam imkor adam kol ma sheyesh lo, ve'isa bat talmid chacham, ועשי ביתו לתלמיד חכם. You should do everything you can to marry a daughter of a תלמיד חכם. And if you have a daughter, make sure you do everything you can that she marry someone that is great in learning Torah. High scholar of Torah, תלמיד חכם. משל, לענבי הגפן בענבי הגפן. What is it? Similar to, you take the seeds of the grape, And together you plant them with other seeds of grape, which is a wonderful thing. Why? The two best fruits in the whole world, it's grapes. That's the, the nation of Israel is compared to grape. It's very good that the grape goes together with grape. Do not, ma- do not marry a daughter of Amaretz. Or marry your son to, uh, to, to a girl that is uh, his daughter of Amaretz. Why? Because it's similar to the seeds of the grape and the seed of the thorns, the bush, which is a very ugly thing and cannot be accepted. You take the greatest fruit and the worst bush and try to mix them together. Terrible. The Gemara continues. If a person do everything he can to marry a daughter of a Talmud Chacham, and he cannot find, there's none, he should marry the daughter of Gdol Ador, the leader of the generation. What do we learn from here? That back there in their time, Gdol Ador doesn't mean he was the greatest in Torah. There could be other people who knows more Torah than him. But they're anonymous, they're not leaders. Like Rav Ben-Zion Abba Shaul was the biggest Chacham on earth, but he didn't want to be a, 
a leader of hundreds of thousands of... Rav Ovadia Yosef was a leader. Rav Eliashi was a leader. Rav Shach was a leader. Many of those great Talmidei Chachamim were big leaders. They're not only great in Torah, they were great in helping the generation to do, not to do, to direct them. But some Chachamim don't want this. They want to sit and learn. They don't want to be bad their half of their days accepting people, giving them advice, because it hurts their Kedusha. All day they have to see wicked people coming, you know, asking questions, you know. They have to go into their conversation with them. They speak about not modest things. He doesn't want this. He wants to be in holiness all his life. So it's very possible that there is a, some kind of a chacham somewhere that hardly, maybe 2,000 people in the whole world knows who he is. And the other one, everybody knows who he is, but that chacham is greater than this. But if you cannot find him, go for the daughter of Gdol Ador, which is the second degree. <laughs> second degree, Gdol Ador. Lo matzabat gdol ador. You didn't find a daughter of gdol ador. Isa bat rosh rashi knesiot. A rabbi of a shul. What we say, local rabbi. It's not some giant chacham, but he knows how to answer the community questions. Lo matzabat rashi knesiot. Isa bat gabay tzedaka. You cannot find a daughter of a rabbi of a shul. Find a daughter of someone who is in charge of charity. Collect from the rich and give to the poor. Why? What's so important about it? It's like a clerk. How exactly it's going to benefit yourself or your son? The answer in the old days, they did not nominate to such a job anyone unless he was 100% honest. With dignity. Clean hands will never touch a penny that it's not his. That's also very good for your children. If you die, someone like this will raise them. He will make sure they learn Torah, even though he's not so great in Torah, but at least he has very, very clean hands, not some kind of a, of a corrupted crook. Lo matzabat gabay tzedaka, isabat melamdei tinokot. You cannot find someone who's in charge of charity. Find a rabbi of a cheder. First grade Rebbe, he teach kids. I would think that Rebbe is greater than a Gabay Tzedaka. No. Why? Who does he teach? He teach kids to read. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Bereshit, in the beginning, Bara Elokim. <laughs> Big deal. Every religious Jew can almost do it. Doesn't mean you're Talmid Chacham. Top. Ve'alisa bat Yehudi Amaret. No matter what, do not agree to marry a girl that comes from an ignorant home. By the way, everything I told you doesn't apply today 100%. Who knows why? Who knows why? Because girls go to school today. In the, in the, in the time when it was written 2,000 years ago, there was no such thing girls going to yeshiva. Bet Yaakov, until Sarah Schneerer started Bet Yaakov, girls did not go to school. There was no such concept, even secular girls. The rest of the women did not go to school. Women would take care of the home, of the cows, of the sheep, of the chicken. They would sow, they would clean the parsley, they would sell in the market, they would sew garments, knit, doing all kinds of cleaning. That's the way the world was. Women were proud to be housewives. Not like now, they brainwash them and turn them into men. She has to work 12 hours a day in the office all day with all kinds of lions and guidos. <laughs> Destroy the life of our women with the corrupted society we live in. Women were proud. Today, a woman, if you tell her, ah, it's just going to be all your life in a kitchen, raising kids, changing diapers, taking care of the, of the sheep, taking care of the, of the chickens, collecting the eggs. Sure. I want an educated guy, Rabbi. Can you find me Shiduch? Why would you like educated? No, if at least she wants educated in Torah, very nice. No, she doesn't care about Torah. Educated in university. 
he knows about Tolstoy and Shakespeare and all the rest of the nonsense. How exactly is going to help her, that educated guy? Now you may say, well, she, she means money. Educated, she means, she doesn't want to say, find me a rich guy. So she found a nice way to say, find me a professional, <laughs> academic, educated. <laughs> I always thought that that's a nice word to say, find me a very heavy duty guy. <laughs> Until one time, I had this girl. And uh, I wanted to set her up with the son of one of the richest Jews in the world. <coughs> and uh, she asked me, is he educated? I say he went to yeshivas, but he didn't go to university. She said, no, no, I want educated. I said, what do you need educated? His father has $15 billion. You're going to live in a mansion with servants. You're going to have uh, the life of a, of a princess. How exactly is going to help you if you know some math or some dentistry or to be an architect? <laughs> You're going to be loaded with anything you want. No, I don't care about the money. Oh, she has an ideology. They brainwash her so well that she wants a poor educated guy, unemployed. I care she has a degree. He got a degree from Bernie Sanders and his friends. And Chuck Schumer. Do you see how can you brainwash a, a, a brain of a girl or a, or a boy and turn them into a corrupted robot? So sad what they do to the kids. Even parents here in Flatbush that worth over a billion dollars brainwash their kids no matter what, you must go to university. And then they pay the price. Three years later, when the boy come with some girl, Christina, I will convert her. No, we don't accept converts in our community. I would leave the community. I will never talk to you again. I don't care. He sells his own family. He sells the money, give up everything, and go and marry her somewhere. And then the father regret. Why? Why did I send him to college? Why? What was it for? You have a billion dollars. Just put him into business. Anyway, you learn everything while you begin to work. I remember once I went to Toronto, the guy who invited me was a dentist. And uh, he said, Rabbi, why don't you come to my uh, office? i show you the office. Okay, we have, it was in, uh, the lecture is at night. It was 1, 2 p.m. I went to his office, beautiful office. Looks like a very successful dentist. Has a lot of rooms, you know. So I asked him, Tell me, if I would come to work here with you and you teach me from A, from A to Z, dentistry, everything, teach me how to clean, filling, root canal, every, whatever you do, how long will it take me to be exactly like you, professional dentist? He said to me, maximum three months. That's it. So I would know everything you know, say everything I know. Three months, from morning to evening. 90 days. How many years they sit in dentistry school? College plus dental school, how many years? More than 10, huh? The biggest scam in the history, colleges. 95% of what you learn there is not necessary for your future, for your profession. You can ask Benji, he'll tell you. I show you how, you know, I, I once read an article that 80% of the Americans who went to college do not do anything that relates to what they learn in college. Meaning they find a different job. What are you? Insurance broker. So why did you need to teach business in Baruch College <laughs> to become, I can also be an insurance broker without education. Just go and get a job and become a salesman, sell insurance. They teach you all the policies. You learn two, three weeks, and you know how to sell. Right or wrong? Right. It's a big scam, big scam. The Rambam became a doctor without college and without medical school, and he was better than any doctor you know, anyone. How did he learn? 
people used to teach each other. Doctor teach another person, he become a doctor, and he, you know, he works with a doctor and he learns the job. Same thing you learn construction. How all Arabs are in construction. Every Arab, Ahmed, what do you do? Oved be shibutzim. Shibutzim. You know what shibutzim? They want to say shibutzim, but they cannot say P, so they say shibutzim. They call themselves Palestinians, but they cannot say P, so they say Palestinian. That just show you the scam of the Palestinians. Who invented the name Palestine? Who knows? The Romans. The Romans made fun of the Jews 2,000 years ago, and they named Israel Palestine. After who? After Plishtim, Philistines, which has nothing to do with the Arabs. It's a different nation. They used to be in Gaza. Gaza, in those areas, they used to be Plishtim. Those are the ones who killed Shimshon. Or Shimshon killed them together. Shimshon was finding Delilah and the Philistines. They're not Arabs. They're not from the children of Ishmael. So now Arabs from the Middle East came to the Holy Land and sat over there and named themselves after the name that the Romans made up. But who are these Arabs? Egyptians, Syrians, Iraqis, Jordanians. It's all our regular Arabs from the Middle East. There's no such a nation, Palestinian. There's no such thing. Until 1964, nobody ever claimed Palestinians. There was no, all of a sudden, all, there's a nation, a new nation. They have no history, no history books. They never had a government. They never had a flag until then. They never had an anthem. They never had a representative in the United Nations. There's not one museum about their history. It's regular Arabs. And by the way, through their names, you can say from what country they came. Professor Mordechai Kedar is a world expert to Arab history and Islam. He knows Arabic better than them. He argued with them in Al Jazeera and make fun of them about their Quran, which they are so ignorant about. <laughs> He told the guy, Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran. So the Arabs are starting to laugh. <laughs> you crazy? Yahud, you crazy? Jerusalem is not in the Quran? Say, yeah. Show me Jerusalem one time in the Quran. All of a sudden it became serious. By the way, I saw an interview a few months later with that host. And they asked him, what was the most embarrassing moment in your entire career as a journalist? He said, when this professor, Kedar, told me that Jerusalem is not mentioned in the Quran, I thought he's totally crazy. It's out of his mind. I started to make fun of him in live interview. And after thousands of times I spoke about Jerusalem, Jerusalem is holy to the Muslims, and this Jew come and tell me in my face that the root Jerusalem is not even mentioned in the Quran. And later I found out that he's right. I didn't know where to hide. <laughs> <laughs> so Professor Kedar, he says, you tell me their last name, I'll tell you from what country they came. He know the tribes. El Masri from Egypt. El Baghdadi from Baghdad. They have names. Through their names, you know where they came from. Similar to the Jews. The last name of the Jews, Sfaradim or Ashkenazim, you know where they came from. For instance, you have a lot of Syrians, their last name is Ashkenazi. Moshe Ashkenazi, Yosef Ashkenazi, David Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi is European. Ashkenaz. Why Syrians name Ashkenazi? That means that their parents came from Ashkenaz into Syria. And after a few generations, when they came, so the Syrians, how the, how the Syrians will talk about them? Who are you talking about? The Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi, Ashkenazi, it becomes their last name. Lemashal Goldsmith. Someone who was dealing with gold. The last name shows where you came from. A lot of the people, you know. For instance, Iraqis, all of them have last name that is a first name. Moshe, Ovadia, Yosef, all the Iraqis, David, 
their last name is regular first name, the Iraqis. Like Ovadia Yosef, David Nachum, Moshe Avram. That's their name, Iraqi. So you know right away, Iraqi. Persian, all their name finish with An. Amrian, Shansian, Bukhari, Ov, Ov, Ov. Kafkazim also some of them Ov. Russian. So from the name, you know where the people came from. Kafkaz, Afghanistan. Anyway, Rabotai, we'll go back to what I was reading to you about the Ame Aratzot. The Torah says, I'm embarrassed to read it. I have to skip. If you want to see what's written, read it in Gemara, in Masechet Psachim, page 49. The Chachamim define what Am Haaretz is. If you, read, if you read it, and you are in Am Haaretz, you have to cry for two weeks straight. So I'll skip that. And the Gemara continue, and the Gemara says, Amar Rabbi Akiva, if you have to go on a trip, on a journey, make sure you do not go together with Amaretz. Asur li tlavot imo baderech, shenemar ki hu chayecha v'orech yamecha. Why? If I want to walk and someone next to me is complete Amaretz, that's a no Torah. Why should I not take him with me? The answer is, Rabotai, al chayav lo chas. Al chaye chavero lo kol sheken. He doesn't care about his own life. He doesn't learn Torah, he doesn't care about his olam haba. If we have a problem in a journey, he would care about me. He doesn't care about his own neshama. Better to take someone that care about, you know, Torah and knows Torah. I skip a lot of the things because it's very, very offensive. Rabbi Akiva said, when I was in Amaaretz, before I became Baal Tshuva, I would say, give me a, a Talmid Chacham. Give me someone who knows a lot of Torah, ve'en shachenu kechamor, that I will bind him like a donkey. Amru lo Talmidav, a student told him, Rabbi, emor kakelev. You should say, I would bind him like a dog. Dogs usually bite, not donkey. Why you say, bite him like a donkey? Amar lahem Rabbi Akiva, ze no shech ve shover ha'etzem, ve ze no shech ve en shover ha'etzem. A dog that bite, he doesn't have the ability to smash the bones, to crack the bones and turn them into powder. When a donkey bites, there is no more bone. That's it. You're done for life. Tanya. היה רבי מאיר אומר, רבי מאיר אומר, this is the greatest rabbi has ever lived, right here in this page, the greatest ever lived, the greatest תנאים. כל המסי ביתו לעם הארץ, everyone who marries daughter to an ignorant Jew, who is an ignorant Jew, an Israeli jet pilot, ביבי נתניהו, the president of the Supreme Court, Every lawyer in Israel, every doctor, every cardiologist, all of them are Me'aratzot. I don't want you to, to get the wrong impression here. Amaretz means someone who doesn't know Torah well, but he's a great mathematician. I can care less. He's the head judge in Tel Aviv court. I can care less. He's a cardiologist. He's a brain surgeon. I can care less. He's a jet pilot. He's an intelligent guy. He's high IQ. Nobody can predict. He doesn't know any Torah. Aaron Barak, Shem Reshaim Irkav, in the interview a few months ago, he said, I'm very sorry that I never learned Judaism. He didn't know how to say Shema Yisrael. He had to repeat what the guy said. He's nine years old, the head of the Supreme Court. Professor in Harvard for law, law school in Harvard. Israeli man. Very intelligent. I have a lot of degrees. Sent a lot of innocent people to prison in his career. And set up a lot of terrorists free that they should kill more Jews. Fought everything that Hashem loved. Helped everything Hashem hated. Destroyed Israel from inside. No one made a bigger damage to Israel like this Rasha Merusha. And he couldn't say Shema Israel. Age 90. 
that some arets. You marry your daughter to someone like that, Shem Yerachem. I will be more precise. Let's see what Rabbi Meir say. Kol HaMesi et Vito Le'am Ha'aretz Ki'ilu kofta u'manichata lifnei ha'ari It's like tying her to a tree in front of a hungry lion. The hungry lion walks in the area. The girl is tied to a tree. She can move and the lion is coming closer. That's how it compared to same way a lion gore you with his head and then stick his teeth in your neck and rip it apart and kill you. First he hit you, then he swallow you alive. Say that's how Amma Aretz is. He beat up his woman and forced her to have intimacy. Whether she's in a mood, she's able, she's not able, doesn't care. Is an animal. The attacker, like the lion, attack his prey. This was written 2,000 years ago, Rabotai. If the Chachamim would live today and they see domestic violence, what happened today in the world, every other woman gets punches and abuse and who knows what. Forget about the Arab world. I don't even want to start. But even in our world, what it became... So it says like this: Mario odores vochel af amaaretz makeu boel ve'en lo boshet panim and he has no shame. It's not even embarrassed how he became. Why? Because he doesn't have to lie. He became worse than an animal. Tanya idach. The Gemara say on the other hand, il malet zrichim anu laim lemasau matan ayur gimotanu. If they wouldn't need us to be their customers, meaning they make money of us, the Haredim, they would rather kill us. That's how much they hate us. This was 2,000 years ago. That's before the demonstrations in Tel Aviv against the Haredim. This was, this was in a generation that people saw Chacham would kiss his hand. But the Chachamim told you, make no mistake. They hate us very much, the ignorant Jews. They cannot stand Chachamim. Even in their subconscious, they can't stand you. Why? It said the only reason they don't kill us is because we are their customers in a the business. They need us. They sell us jewelry. They sell us food. We are their customers. Tanya Amar Rabbi Elazar, Kol Aosek Batora Bifne Amaretz, Keilu Boel Arusato Befanav. If you show your divine wisdom in front of an ignorant, wicked Jew, it's like taking his wife and have intimacy with her in front of him. Do you understand what I just said here or no? It's like doing the worst thing you can, uh, you can imagine to do to a man. What can be worse than that? Take his woman in front of him and do what you do? <laughs> it's that sentence. That's how it compared to learn Torah and to show knowledge of Torah and speak about the Torah in front of those haters of the Torah, those lefty liberals like Bernie Sanders, Imach Shimo, and the rest of his friends. It drives them crazy. It would be a miracle if he had a gun that he doesn't shoot you. A goy would respect it. These Amaretz, Rasha Merusha, is willing to kill you. Why? Just be quiet. I don't want to hear your Torah. Doesn't care. He doesn't care. He can't stand it. Shneemar Torah tzivalanu Moshe morasha keilat Yaakov al tikre morasha ela meorasa. Torah tzivalanu Moshe. Moshe ordered us the Torah morasha. Morasha means Yerusha, inheritance. The Jews inherited the divine book of God. Morasha in Meorasa is similar. It's hinting that the same way the Torah is inheritance, it's also like a marriage between us and Hashem, like a chatan and kala. Then the Gemara concludes and we move on. Gdola sin'a shesonim ame aratzot et atalmide chachamim misin'a shesonim avovde kochavim et Yisrael unshotehem yoter mehem Translation 
the hatred that the ignorant Jews have towards the high scholar of Torah, the Bachurei Yeshivot, the Rashi Yeshivot, the Chachamim, Gdolei Ador, they hate them so much, more than what the Goim hates them. Those Arabs in Gaza, you ask him, how much you, have, how much you hate Rav Ovadia Yosef from zero to a hundred? Connect him to a light detector. Maybe it will be 70, 80 percent. There are people he hates, we hate more. How much you hate him, the Chacham of the Jews? 80 percent. You go to this Aaron Barak and his friends, all these liberals. How much you hate him? 5,000 percent. There's no words to describe how much I hate them. I once drove to the Golan Heights, I saw a huge sign. Haredim goes, go back to the gas chambers. Someone put a big sign on the mountain. Haredim, meaning ultra-Orthodox religious Jews, go back to, to, the, to Auschwitz, to the gas chamber. And their wives, even more. The wives of the ignorant people, the fancy lady, when she see the rabbi, oh, she's very allergic. Don't bring him here. Why you donate? We have a problem. Let's donate to the yeshiva. No! <laughs> I remember this one guy. He wants to donate a hundred dollar a month to Kiruv. After two, three months, he said, Rabbi, I have a problem. What? My wife go crazy when she saw that I donate. She's, she hates religion, but you especially she hates. <laughs> because everything you speak about, it's her. And she can't handle the truth. So she say, if you continue to donate to Rabbi Mizrahi, I will divorce you. I'll take the kids and leave. But I care about my soul. So I want to continue to donate. But can you do me a favor? What? Don't charge my card in Rabbi Mizrahi Kiruv Organization's <laughs> website. Use it in a supermarket in Monsi. I say, what? He say, yeah. When she see a name of a supermarket, she would ask me, how come there's a supermarket in New York? I will tell her that I support a poor family. I let them use the card for $100 every 15th of the month. Why? She cannot stand religion. You understand? And if ever the card is declined, don't leave me, please, any message on the WhatsApp. She check my messages. <laughs> Just leave me a message to call you and we'll talk on the phone when I'm alone. For hundred dollar a month, uh, it sounds like he's about to give me as a building or something. <laughs> no, no, no joke. You think he's the only one? This is the words of the Gemara, and the Gemara concludes: Shana upiresh kashem ikulam. Someone who used to be religious and left the religion is the worst one. There's no one that hates religious people and rabbis more than him. Why? It reminds him of how it used to be. They stay righteous and I became wicked. Psychologically, he knows he's here and they are here. He cannot take it. What is it like? You and your friend grew up together. He went in the right direction and became someone great and you went into crime and horrible lifestyle and became some drug addict junkie on the streets going in and out of jail. Every time you see that friend, you want to kill him because it pinched your heart. I was greater than him in school. I remember from my father, Alava Shalom, that he was in school in uh, south of Tel Aviv. It wasn't such a great area where, he, where they grew up in those days. And there was one very famous professor in Israel. He went to Machon Weizmann, became a top world scientist. And he was in my father's class. Every time they showed him on TV, I saw how my father is suffering. 
Why? He's cutting diamonds, working like a slave from morning to night all his life. And the guy was sitting next to him in a class, became a world-class professor in Mahon Weizmann, in one of the greatest institutions for science in the world. And, he, oh, and always my father used to say, but I was greater than him in English. <laughs> I was the best in my class in English. So I asked my father, why only English you learn and nothing else? He said, because I knew there's no future in Israel financially. I was preparing for the day that one day I will meet an American rich Jew from America and she will take me to America and I will have the life. And in the end, I got your mother. <laughs> Do you get the point or no? He already thought if I have any chance to have a future financially, if I get out of Israel and go to America. It was very hard days in Israel. Remember, Israel was just the beginning. It's, there was the first years of the state. Life was not easy. Financially, it was very difficult. But from that class, one of the greatest scientists came out. It's very similar to someone that was in yeshiva. He was great. I tell you, I had in Sukkot someone by me that was in our yeshiva 15 years ago. When I was, maybe 20 years ago, when I was still teaching in yeshiva Gemara, he was there. And he was, he's a very sharp guy, very smart. But after a few years, he was in yeshiva, two, three years, he went to work. Met an American girl, got married, had two, two kids, got divorced and went back to work, now he's working. Every time he come to me for Shabbat or for holidays, and we go to the yeshiva and he see all the guys arguing, Torah, learning, it kills him. Say to me, I, I could have been, he looks at my brother in yeshiva, what he became. He see other people who used to be when he was there, how great they are in Torah now. They have six, seven, Eight children, all of them great, brilliant kids, holy, modest, classy. He goes to eat by them in Yom Tov. He sees his life, he sees their life. Shomer mitzvot, still religious. He looks at them, he says, it kills me. I could have been like them. I said to him, you could have been much better than them. Your potential is greater than them. Look what they became and look what you became. And he said to me, I, I'm thinking about it all the time. Maybe I made a mistake of my life. I said to him, no, it's not too late. Still can go back and learn. Ah, now I have to pay child support, this, that. I'm a slave of, the, of, my, of my reality. That's it. And it's so true, and it happened to so many people. So many people, they see their friends from yeshiva, what they became. Then they look at their life, what they became. Some of them left the religion. They marry even non-Jews. They went to some countries. I don't know, marry Chinese, Thailandi girl. She eat mice in a plate in his house. And he's thinking, oh my God, look at the wife I chose. Yeah, no, no, no joke. No joke. They eat cockroaches and, and worms and all of that. You know, one of the, the, the Chachamim asked, why did Hashem made worms? What do we need worms in the world? Now everything you have to check. Flower, maybe they have worms. Fruits have worms. Vegetable have worms. Everything green, full of worms. Why Hashem made worms in the world? It's a nightmare. What, is, what, do, they, what do we need them for? What? Forget about the worms. Only problems. Barely half of the things you have to check ten times before you eat. There are certain things you can never eat, like figs, broccoli, you have to cut the, the top of it. There's no way to clean it even. But I don't know. So, one of the answers, you'll be shocked. You'll be shocked. The answer is, worms really, the world could have survived without them. They're not, not, not so necessary to the creation. Yes, they are used as food for the birds, for you know, other animals eat them. Hashem could have made them different food. Doesn't need really worms. 
But one of the answers is kind of shocking. Hashem said, every time the Jewish people rebel against me and they deserve, God forbid, execution, meaning they don't deserve to stay alive, they really deserve annihilation, I looked at the, I look at the worms that I created for no need. Could have managed without them. And I say, what, the worms that have no benefit to the world and who needs them? Everyone would rather live without them and I keep them alive and take care of them. My children, which are billion, trillion times more important than these worms, isn't it needless to say that I should defend them and protect them and not, not, not clean them from the face of the world? Kalva Homer. I only have one kushia about this. What the Chinese would eat if there would not be worms? In China, they come with a big barrel. You open the lid. You look inside, you get the shock of your life. A lot of things are moving. Grasshoppers, worms, cockroaches. And they sell appetizers, small mice, still moving. They put them in a plate with soy sauce, few broccoli, you know, no joke, no joke. In my own eyes I saw. It's very, very common. They take two sticks, pick up the mice, which still move his tail and his head, throw it into his mouth, after he dipped him in a soy sauce, and then he eats a little bit from the broccoli. And worms, they have a cup like this, stereophone cup. The guy picks up all the cockroaches and the worms, fill up the plate, he pays him. On the street, open up his mouth and dump all the worms into his mouth and eat them. How much money I will have to pay you for you to agree to fill up your mouth with cockroaches and, and worms and swallow it? A thousand dollars, who would agree? Two thousand. Three thousand. Five thousand. Ten thousand. No, be honest. Ten thousand. One shot, you swallow it. Fifteen thousand. She said not even 50 million. Do you know some of these Chinese, if you give them $10,000, they live 10 years with that in the village in China. They make themselves a little straw house. They eat rice and some insects. And life is uh, very primitive. No electric there, nothing. They get water from the lake, like the old days. If you come and tell him, I'll give you $10,000 for you not to eat the worms. <laughs> it's going to jump to the sky from happiness. You won't agree, huh? even for 10000 to eat? Imagine if I tell him I want you to eat the rat in order for me to give you $10,000. I eat it for free, why you have to pay me? That's the reality of the world, Rabotai. By the way, when you say in the morning, Baruch Shelo Asani Goy, you do not think about this kind of Goy. You have to think about Biden, Trump, Hussein Obama, the king of Saudi Arabia, Michael Jordan, successful people. That the whole world is jealous with them. I don't know, Hollywood movie stars. All these people that have hundreds of millions of fans. No joke. If you think, oh, bless you God for didn't make me the guy, the homeless guy in December collecting quarters, and freezing in Manhattan. And, uh, you know, nobody wants to be. Even the other going don't want to be him. Ah, but if I would be Michael Jordan, the best player ever in the history of the game, made a billion dollars, successful, you know. Why not have such life? Houses everywhere, servants everywhere, everyone bow down to him. You know, I had the life. Without basketball, what would, what would he be? Work in a baker store until today. A basketball made him a billionaire. He knew how to play better than anyone. Became what he became. This is what you have to have in mind. Bless you, Hashem, for making me an ordinary, simple, poor Jew. I rather this a billion times more before a prince or a king or anyone that is not Jewish.
even if it's a righteous Gentile. Righteous Gentiles go to heaven. Hashem loves them. They're not idol worshippers. They're not murderers. They follow the guideline of Hashem. They are very righteous. But if you are a righteous Jew, it's a higher level. If you are a wicked Jew, maybe it's better to be a righteous Gentile. Yeah. Now, Rabotai, before time is finished, we have about 10 minutes left. I want to read to you the finale of tonight. I left the best to the end. Let me read to you the words of the Rambam, what we have to do in a time of tragedy. You ready? This is Ilchot Ta'aniyot, Rambam, Zmanim, Perek Rishon. First chapter, Halacha Aleph, first Halacha. Mitzvat Aseh Min HaTorah, Mitzvah from the Torah. Lizrok, to scream. Ulearia b'chatzotzrot, and to blow the trumpet, meaning to, to, to put sirens. Today we have sirens, we don't need trumpets. But in the old days there was no sirens. So when tragedy arrives, they blow the trumpets in the city. And everyone knows something horrible is happening or happened. Al kol tzara shetavo al atzibur. For every problem that comes to the public, שנאמר על הצער הצורר אתכם והרעותם בחצוצרות. It's a clear verse in the Torah. When problems come and pressure you, blow the trumpets. What for? To inform the people. It's time to repent. It's time to gather together and pray and cry to Hashem. כלומר, כל דבר שיצר לכם Everything that will put you under pressure, like no rain. Months, no rain comes. No wheat, no barley, no fruits, no vegetables. Or billions of grasshoppers came and ate all the green. There's nothing left. Etc. It's time to blow the trumpet. Vedavar ze. Midarkea Chuvau. This is one of the way to repent. It's a way of repentance. When tragedy come, and everyone scream to Hashem and blow the trumpets, Yedu a call. Everyone will know. What they will know? Who can guess? Everyone will know what? Everyone already knows that grasshoppers clean all the trees. They don't need the trumpets to tell them. You go out and you see. You see billions of grasshoppers coming like clouds, filling up the place. Or oh, that this pandemic, people are dying from viruses every minute. Or oh, that the goyim attacking the city. And then any minute they'll kill everyone. Everybody already knows what they need the trumpets to tell them. They go from word to mouth right away. Listen to the words of the Rambam. It's very precise. בזמן שתבוא צרה ויזעקו עליה, when the tragedy come and they scream for it, ויריעו, meaning they already scream before even they blow the trumpets, meaning they know about the tragedy. They scream to Hashem. ידעו הכל, everyone will know, שבגלל מעשיהם הרעים הוא רע להם. Everyone will know that we are now paying the price for our crimes against Hashem. That's what everyone has to know. The trumpets are not to inform you that there is a tragedy. It's to inform you now, if you don't repent now, tomorrow will be too late for you. Your last chance to save your life and your children. Now you have to repent. That's the situation we're in right now, today. Every one of us. Every Jew in the world, not only in Israel. If there won't be Israel, there won't be Jews in America or anywhere else. We will be next. What do you think? What do you think? When Jews were in exile, they constantly suffer anti-Semitism and attacks. And even that, Biden said in his speech, he was 100% right. If there's no Israel, there's no safety for the Jews no matter where they are. He said it in his speech. If you understand that, we might as well understand that as well. Rabotai and Rambam continue. 
שבגלל מעשיהם הרעים הוא רע להם. The tragedy came because of our sins. ככתוב, as it's written, עוונותיכם איתו. Your sins, your intentional sins, turned everything against you, to the negative side. איתו means turned from the positive into the negative. וזהו שיגרום להם להסיר הצהרה מעליהם. And this, and I, I say it clear, this and only this, only this will remove the tragedy from them. Not the United States, not the United Nations, not the great Israeli soldiers with all the respect and love I have for them, and appreciation and gratitude. They're just people. And if Hashem decreed something, the greatest soldiers would lose to these Arab farmers, monsters, who just yesterday didn't learn how to shoot a gun and look how they succeed. September 11 is the best proof. A bunch of Arabs never knew how to fly. They went few, few lessons to classes in Florida, learned how to fly a big Boeing plane and flew directly into the twins. Do you know how many, how many success they have in those days? Over here, over here, or everything succeeded for them. That plane, this plane, what's going on here? Shem decided that that's what's going to happen to America and there's nothing you can do about it. Same thing will happen to us. <laughs> if we move on business as usual, where are you? Tomorrow we fly to Florida, vacation, winter vacation, Rabbi. What do you mean? People are dying every second to defend the Jewish nation. How do you have the head to go on vacation? Rabbi, we planned it before Sukkot. No. So what? Situation change. It's the only time we can go on vacation. So your brothers and sisters will die and get raped and their children will... Well, their head will be chopped and you're going to lay in the, by the pool in Florida or by the beach, even worse. Where is your heart? Only, I only care about myself, Rabbi, I'll be honest with you. I'm not Israeli. I'm American. American. I'm first American, then I'm a Jew. <laughs> That's how the Germans also spoke in Germany before Hitler came. I'm German. They changed the Sidur from Jerusalem to, the, to Berlin. Changed their name to German names. The rest, you know what happened, right? Aval im lo izaku, if you won't scream, ve lo yariu, and you don't blow the trumpets. Ela yomru, they will say, davar ze miminag haolam, that's the way the world is. Tragedies come, grasshoppers come, viruses come, wars happen. You know, that's the way they, that's the way it is. זה ממנהג העולם הרע לנו, וצרה זו נקרה נקראת, מקרה, coincidence, nature, no rain, the ozone warmed up, help us to save the ozone. הרי זו דרך אכזריות, this is cruelty. Cruelty. וגורמת להם להידבק במעשיהם הרבים. If you don't scream to Hashem and repent, and you don't blow the trumpet to wake up the hearts of the people, this is cruelty. Explain to me please why it's cruelty. Let's see who understands. What's cruelty over here? You can say it's stupidity. It's wickedness. It's ungratefulness. Why cruelty? Because thousands of people will die because of that. When you don't care and you don't repent and you don't scream and you don't cry, more will die and more will die. That's cruelty. You don't care that your brothers and sisters will die in a horrible way. The Rambam continues, cruelty. Not only the Nazis and the Hamas are cruel. You are also cruel. 
I'm suffering and I'm cruel? Yes. Because you could avoid the suffering and save people around you, or maybe save yourself and your children. They're stubborn. They don't leave their sin. I can't. I can't live without it, Rabbi. Whatever happened, happened. I'm sorry. And new tragedies will come. Not just what they have right now. Tomorrow will be something new. Something new. Who shekatuv batorah? What does it mean, something new? Hashem is so angry at us. He's giving us one smack, and we move on like nothing happened. Ah, we said, we cry, you know, we feel terrible, but we don't want to change. We don't want to stop with our nonsense. And Hashem, see, let's uh, just wait that it will be over and we can go back to our routine criminal lifestyle. What does Hashem do? Add more punches. Different kind, worse. What caused that? 100% us. Shenemar, it's written in the Torah. What does it mean in Parashat Bechukotai? If you don't listen to me and you continue with your nonsense, Who knows what does it mean? What does it mean? It's Mikre. Ah, coincidence. Nature, random, bad luck. It's Obama's fault. Iran's fault. Hezbollah's fault. The anti-Semite Goim's fault. The stupid army. The intelligent who fell asleep. The stupid prime minister. Maybe they all have share in the disaster. Some more, some less. But with or without them, it would come to you. Because it's the end. He got the approval of Hashem. Why don't you understand? I would leave you to coincidence. Okay. You want to play this game? That's the game you get. Klomar, Rambam explained. When I bring you a tragedy, to make you repent. What's the purpose of tragedies? To wake us up to repent. That's the, that's the purpose of it. It's not revenge. It's to shake us up. If you say it's not God, it's coincidence, it's random, it's nature. That's the way nature is. The Chinese made a virus in, in one over there. COVID is the Chinese. They did it. Chinese, not Chinese. Maybe they did. What, would, what difference does it make? Hashem decided it's going to come and check the whole world. If you're going to say it's random, I will add to you more of this, what you call random. Meaning more punches will come. Now the Chachamim added, it's mitzvah to fast until Hashem will turn into, from judgment to mercy and to scream and to pray and to beg and to blow the trumpets and the shofar, which is the judgment. But you don't do it on Shabbat and not on holidays. What do you mean? It's a big tragedy. Shabbat. Tragedy. Shabbat, you don't blow the trumpets. And you don't fast. Why? Shabbat is a special day. It's not a day for mourning. Even if someone's father died, or whatever happened, Shabbat is back to normal. You don't mourn on Shabbat. But you got the point. I think we covered everything. I also wanted to speak about Bereshit. But no, it's got too late already to start with that. You can go to previous year's lectures about Bereshit. Any questions before we finish? Um, if someone who is not so religious, let's say, starts religion with the Sochat, and then they 
No, no. There's a difference living like a goy or being a goy. We imitate the way the goyim behave. It doesn't turn us into goyim officially. It just, we just look like the, the culture of the goyim. But we don't need to convert if we want to do tshuva. The goyim wants to be like us. They have to convert to Judaism. Same thing with Halel Shabbat. It's count 100% like a non-Jew. 100%. However, the minute he says, Hashem, forgive me, chatati, aviti, pashati, I'm not going to be Mechalel Shabbat anymore. Immediately, he turns from Rasha to beginning of Tzaddik. He turns right away to a different highway. Even though, he's, you know, yes, a minute ago he was very wicked in, against Hashem, and now all of a sudden he changed his attitude and his behavior. He doesn't need to convert. I always give a beautiful mashal about it. There are two people who are not allowed to drive right now. Ruven and Shimon. Now, give me a ride. I don't have a license. What do you mean? I saw you driving. Yes, I, I'm suspended. That's Ruven. Ruven used to have a license and he got suspended. Shimon never had a license. Both of them are not allowed to drive. If they drive and a police offer, officer pull them over, he will arrest them. Driving without a license. Suspended or never had a license. He's going to go to jail. What is the difference? Reuven that had a license and lost it, that's a Jew that is Mechalel Shabbat. He was born with a Jewish soul, with a ticket to life of eternity, but he did not follow the instruction on the ticket. So he got suspended. The ticket is suspended. Your license is right now suspended. You count like a non-Jew. You're not a driver. What do you mean? I know how to drive. I was a driver, yes, but now your license is suspended. That means you have no permission to drive or to drive people. Once you fix what you did, or pay the fine, or you know, then you're immediately able to drive. You don't need to go again to take classes and pass the road test. Why? As soon as the suspension is removed, you're back to be a driver. That's a Mechalel Shabbat. The other one is never, he never been a driver. He never took classes. He has to learn and to pass the road test to get a license. Both of them right now cannot drive, but there's a difference. One has to pay the fine or to remove the suspension and he can drive right away and the other one has to go to a process to become a driver. That's the goy. Want to be a Jew? Fadal, welcome. But, yalla, start learning. After you learn, you read the book, Welcome to Judaism, of the Tzaddik Rabbi Binyamin Golan. Shem Ishmerehu Vichayehu is a great person. And he, and he, he put in one book everything a guy needs to know in order for him to be a Jew. Everything. In one book. Until now, he needed ten books. Combine everything based on his experience many years in a bad din converting so many people. Now, he made it very easy and with pictures, with beautiful pictures, everything is so clear. You read it once, you're already very knowledgeable. The 13 principles of Judaism, how to pray, everything. In one book. Very easy today to be a Jew. You order the book on divineinformation.com, 30 bucks. A few months later, you're ready to already kick, kick in. <laughs> Any more questions? Baruch Hashem. We're done for today. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akash.